Amen. So keep your place in Romans 14, if you would. We're not going to get there for a few minutes, but keep your place there. Um, that's going to be a main chapter that we visit tonight. So tonight, I'm excited. We're starting a new sermon series tonight called The Bible Family. And what is that? What, what do I mean by that? The Bible Family. The Bible teaches many things. I mean, the Bible, I've said many times that the Bible, inside the Bible is the answers for any problem, anything that you will have in your life, anything that will arise. The Bible and applying the Bible to that issue um, will solve it for you. It has all of the answers. It's an infinite book, but the Bible has different things. The Bible has a lot of stories in it. The Bible has a lot of history in it. The Bible has doctrines in it. And then the Bible has concepts in it. And what we're going to look at tonight, and not tonight, but in this series, starting tonight, we're going to look at what does it look like if we apply the Bible properly to our families, to our homes, to our children, to our marriages? What does that look like to our friendships? What does that look like? What are the results of that? What will that produce? All right, now look, this is going to be a series that is heavy on practical application. All right. And the reason is, is that there are doctrines in the Bible and then there are concepts in the Bible that need to be applied in real life, in real life situations. All right. So I need to give a little, you know, prerequisite course here in the in before I start the sermon tonight. And I want to talk about this thing that the Bible gives us. Turn to 1 Peter chapter number 5, if you would. You're keeping a place in Romans 14. But before I even tell you the sermon title, and before I even get into um, tonight's, uh, tonight's sermon, turn to 1 Peter chapter number 5, if you would. And I mentioned this this morning. I mentioned this this morning as well. But the Bible gives us this powerful tool that we are to use in our lives, and we need to understand that. And if you don't understand this tool and how to apply it, you could literally ruin your life. And that's how important this is. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 3. I'm going to give you a couple examples of this, but I mentioned it in Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. All right, so Hebrews chapter 11 in verse number 1, you're going to 1 Peter 5, but it defines what faith is this morning as we looked at the fruit of the Spirit, which is faith. But then what does the Bible do throughout the entire chapter of Hebrews chapter 11? The Bible gives us what? It gives us examples. So it defines what faith is, and then it says, hey, here's what that looks like, and here's what that produced. By giving us real-life examples of people that knew what faith was and did, you know, have faith themselves. And then it showed just the the myriad of, of results at the end of that chapter. Some good, some bad. But again, examples. We had real life examples there. And the Bible points out, and I'm going to tell you why before we even start this series, why examples are so important. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and look at verse number 3. It says, now this is talking about elders or pastors. It says, um, go to verse number 2. It says, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, meaning I can't just like, you know, force you to do whatever I want as a pastor, but willingly, you should follow me willingly, I should be leading you willingly, not for filthy lucre, shouldn't be doing this for money, shouldn't be doing this to get, you know, rich or, you know, gain, you know, income for myself, but of a ready mind. Now look at verse number three, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So what does in samples mean? I love that word, it, it means example. But in sample, I love that word because it's basically meaning it's a sample. So uh, what is an example? An example is a sample of something. Like if you, if you do it, it's a sample. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. Paul's advice to a young preacher here, 1 Timothy chapter number 4. And again, men, husbands, fathers, you can take the advice that is given to a pastor and apply it as you are basically the pastor. That same model is in your home. You are the pastor of your home. You're leading your home spiritually. You're making those physical decisions. You're working to provide for your home, for your family. So you can apply all of this. If you're a husband and a father, you can apply all of this to yourself. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 4 and look at verse number 12. Again, he says, let man, no man despise thy youth. He's saying, don't let people be down on you just because you're younger than them. And then he says this. He says, but be thou an example of the believers 
in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit. Look, that's a big one now, right? What, what kind of spirit should you have? You should have the fruits of the spirit in faith, in purity. He's saying, look, you have to be a sample. To, to, you have to show them how it's done. Now, this isn't saying that a pastor needs to be perfect, have the perfect family. There is no, you know, there is no pastor that has a perfect family, this one included, a perfect marriage, this one included, or that is a perfect pastor, this one included. But what it is saying is this, when it comes to doctrines, when it comes to concepts, God gives us this powerful tool in the Bible that we are to use, which is examples. Examples. What an example is, if, you've, if, you're a, if you're a math person, it's basically a proof. It's a proof. It's somebody that has done this and applied it, and you can see, then you connect it, right? You have concepts in the Bible, and then you have somebody who's an example that has applied concepts, and then the Bible tells you what results you should have, see? So there's concepts and there's results. That's what the Bible gives you. The example is the detail that you need in many cases to connect those two things. All right, now I, I have an object lesson for you tonight to kind of demonstrate this, but this works. Look, this is common sense, okay? This is not like anything, I'm not breaking any, this isn't groundbreaking tonight, all right? This is simple common sense. People that are not saved and that aren't going to get saved, they understand this. This is common sense. People get it, that you should just watch the examples of others. Because look, you are going to get wildly different advice from different people. Even people in different churches will give you wildly different advice. So how do we know? That how you know it is the example. It's the proof. All right. I have a little object lesson for you tonight. All right. So um, we were, you know, we like planes in this church. Luke really likes planes. He flew one right into a tree today. But anyway, I'm sorry to call you out, brother Luke. The plane is fine. It still flies well. And even if it wasn't, it doesn't matter. We all had a good time. All right. But I have an example here. What if I was going to? What if I wanted to build a paper airplane? What if I wanted to build a paper airplane? They had all these people. I had these four people come to me and say, or say I had five people come to me and say, I know how to build the best paper airplane. And they're all talking a pretty good game. Like you need to do it this way and it's going to fly this way. And they're throwing out all kinds of theories and all this stuff. And the first guy comes along and he builds, let me pull out my airplanes here. The first guy comes along and he's got an airplane and it's pretty basic, but he thinks that that is the best way to build an airplane. And he says, look, this is how you do it right here. This is how you build an airplane. It's nice. It's sleek. It's simple. It's fast to build. And, you know, well, I'm like, okay, well, let's see how it flies, right? Let's see. Let's test it out, right? It looks nice, but does it fly? It is an airplane after all. So we try to fly it. Not bad. I mean, it glides pretty well. But then you got guy number two that comes along and he says, no, I know the best way to make a paper airplane. And he makes another airplane and he comes up and he says, the reason that my airplane is better is because, and he even throws in some Bible. He says, you know, the reason that my airplane is better is because I added these little, you know, tips up on the wing. Even birds, even birds that God designed have little, you know, flares up on the ends of their wings for them to glide a long way. And I want an airplane that'll glide a long way. And then I added some elevators here to just make sure it'll glide a little bit further. So let's try it. And he throws it. And that definitely flies a little bit better, all right? But then you get a third guy that comes along and he says, no, the problem is that wasn't a good airplane because it wasn't balanced, right? It wasn't balanced, right? No, those are all good ideas. And he says he's convinced that he has the best way to build an airplane. So you're like, all right, let's see it. And he's like, no, I added the, you know, I got the tips up and he's just, but I balanced the nose a little bit better. I balanced it out. So balance is important when it comes to, and you're like, boy, that sounds pretty good, but let's see it fly. And you want to, you know, this is the example, right? So then we see this one, we see how that flies. And it definitely flies better than the other airplanes, all right? So you're like, all right, I got some examples here. But then you got some guy that comes along off the wall and he's got a whole new design for an airplane. And he tells you, he's like, hey, you know, I got this airplane and it's not just, a, it's not a long gliding airplane, but you know, it does tricks. 
And this airplane, when you throw it, it'll actually do a little loop-de-loop -loop when you fly it. And I'm like, yeah, I don't really believe you. Let's see it. Let's see your example. So we take this airplane, and you see he's got these, I was trying to explain this to the kids today, he's got the ailerons in the back that are going to make the airplane turn. You say, all right, it sounds pretty good in theory, but how does it actually work? And it does work. <laughs> <laughs> and it hits Brother Leon right in the face. But you're okay, right, brother? You're okay. But then you get somebody that comes along and they say, no, all these things are wrong. I have the best way to build an airplane, and I'm, you know, just, I've been building airplanes forever, and all this, and this is how you build an airplane. And you're just like, and you're like, what are you talking about? Because you see, all five of those guys, all six of those guys, are like, oh, I could build it way faster than everybody else. Look at this. Well, you see, all six of those guys talked a pretty good game. All six of those people might have used concepts from the Bible to explain how they were doing the things that they were doing. But it's the example that God gives us. And the reason God puts so much emphasis on the example in the Bible is because many times, and I'm going to explain to you a little bit why this is, but many times, and I have preached on this a ton over the years, many times it is people that are the biggest failures in things that are going to be the first one to try to give you advice. And I know why that is. I mean, there's really two reasons. Turn to Proverbs chapter 16. Turn to Proverbs chapter 16. But the importance of the example cannot be dismissed in your Christian life, especially when it comes to applying concepts in the Bible, all right? Because concepts can be twisted and can be you know, manipulated around and people will go for those things. Not if you know the Bible, but it can be done and it is unfortunately done. All right. So the example itself is the proof. The example itself and the results that come out of that example, that's our protection as Christians. And that's why God calls it out in the Bible. He's like, these are examples. These are examples. The first one is, look at Proverbs chapter number 16. Proverbs chapter 16. Look at verse number 29. So you say, why would people, why would a divorced guy just insist on giving every single person that he knows that's married? This just came, somebody just brought this up to me this week. Somebody that's just completely, it wasn't even divorced, just completely miserable in their marriage and is just like constantly just giving marriage advice on the job site or, or whatever. And like that is so common, I, I can't even begin to describe it to you. You say, why would that be? Look at Proverbs 16 and look at verse number 29. The Bible says this. It says, A violent man enticeth his neighbor and leadeth him into the way that is not good. So here we have a man that's wrong, okay? And it says enticeth his neighbor. He's not being violent against his neighbor. He's trying to get his neighbor to be like him. He's trying to get his neighbor to get into the same wickedness that he's in. I mean, this is where the idea, the, the, you know, the proverb, or you, what you can call it, the saying, I should say, of misery loves company comes in. People that are wicked, they're into wicked things, they're not doing things right, they don't want to be all alone in that. They want everybody else around them to be miserable too. So you have to look at the example of the people that you're dealing with. And the second reason that people that have failed in areas want to give advice in those very areas is, is very simple. It's just pride. It's just pride. They have pride vision. Maybe they don't even know that they failed in those areas, but they have pride vision, as I preached about a couple weeks ago, and that's, that's why you personally need to be looking at the example of the people that you are taking guidance from, taking advice from. I mean, it's the same with everything. I mean, for some strange reason, you know, it's the, it's the guy that can't keep the job. It's the guy that's no good at his job that's going to be the first guy that walks up to you when you're the new guy on the, on the job and, and tells you how things work around here or whatever. It's the guy, I mean, stay away from that guy. The first one that wants to come up and tell you how the things really go around here, and he's the lowest performer, he's on the edge of being fired at every moment in his life, and this is just another stop amongst his long list of, of job stops that he's on. You just need to understand, like, look at the example. Look at the example. And look, God respects this idea of the example. It is a concept in the Bible that is used by God and that we need to apply 
in our lives. Look, there's stories in the Bible. You can't just take a story. And here's a Bible tip for you, by the way. You can't just take a story in the Bible and just turn it into doctrine. You can't do that. You can't just go take some history story of some, some guy that did, because look, there's people that did bad things, there's people that did good things, and everything in between in the Bible. You must take stories in the Bible and then add doctrine to those, and then you can use them as examples, either good or bad, but it must come with the doctrine. So the importance of examples in your life cannot be overstated. All right, that's before we even start the sermon. Now let's get into the sermon. What is the sermon about tonight? You're there in Romans chapter 14. The sermon tonight is the Bible family, the home, the home. We're going to look at the home tonight. What does the home look like? What does your home look like? Where your family resides, where your family lives? What does that look like? If What does the environment of my home look like if I take the Bible, doctrines and concepts in the Bible, and apply it to my home. I'm not talking about your family. I'm talking about your home. And you need to be thinking about this if you have not thought about it before. Turn to Isaiah chapter 32, keeping your place in Romans chapter 14. Isaiah chapter number 32. So I'm going to give you some points tonight on what the home should look like, and then I'm going to give you some practical application on how to do that. All right, look at verse number uh, 18 of Isaiah chapter number 32. So first we're going to look at two things, two results of a home in the Bible, what the Bible says that your home should be like, and then we'll look at how to get there. All right, look at Isaiah 32, verse 18. It says, And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation, and in sure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. So here we see that, okay, peaceable habitation, maybe he's talking about the nation, maybe he's talking about them being not at war, maybe he's talking about just them being in peace, which is definitely a blessing from God that will come upon a nation when they are within God's will. All right, but then look what he says, in sure dwellings. That's talking about where you live. That's talking about your house. All right, what does that mean, sure dwellings? Well, sure means consistent. Sure means stable. So the Bible is saying like when you are in the blessings of God and what God wants for you is to be in a sure dwelling. So first of all, there's many things that this could mean, but basically the first thing that this means is that a sure, to have a sure dwelling, the dwelling should exist. Okay. I mean, you shouldn't be like couch surfing with your family. I mean, that's the first thing. That's not a sure dwelling. Or you say, well, you know, first Timothy five, eight kind of stuff. You're like, well, I don't think you really need to tell. I mean, look, some people need to hear that. Some people need to hear that it is a father, it is a husband's job to provide an actual dwelling place for his family. You're like, well, this is pretty basic. But yeah, but some people need to hear that because some people do not provide that. The next thing is this, and this gets into us tonight, more where we're at. But the home, if, if we're talking about sure dwellings, the home should be stable. The home should be stable. Whatever is implemented in that home, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, it should be stable. It should be, here's another word for that, consistent. The home should not be run or managed in a way where it is managed one way today and another way tomorrow, depending on how you feel or depending on how your wife feels or whatever. Look, whatever it looks like, the environment, the standards, it should be like that every day. And I can't tell you how much even the secular world will tell you. And like when they figure something out, it's obvious. Stability is super important for children. Stability is super important actually for your wife too. But the point is, it should not be different. You need the place to be sure. And look, even they say a man's home is his castle. Like I want my home to be sure. I mean, I don't want my home to be different every single day. I, look, the world, the world is different all the time. I go out in the world, you go out in the world, and we go out and we provide a living for our families. That's what changes. This world is what's going nuts. I go home as a place of, like, it's a fortress of solitude. It's a place to tank sanctuary in your life. It's, it's a, it should be a sure place. And the world is not sure. It is never going to be sure. And I don't expect it to be sure. 
but my home should be. And look, let me tell you something. It is, it is a known fact that change, that constant change, just stresses people out. It stresses everybody out. Constant change stresses out people in general. I mean, there's been so many books on businesses and how to change businesses and management of change and all this different thing gone on just for a bit from a business perspective, but change stresses people out. And look, if something stresses out the husband, it stresses out the wife more and it stresses out the kids even more. Stress, anxiety. What does this come from? Change. So the home, the first point is the home needs to be sure. It needs to be consistent. So when you come up with how you're going to manage the home, that needs to be in mind. That needs to be in mind. Are these things, are these variables, are these things that I can lock in, these standards, can I keep them sure? Or is this something that, you know, I'm just going to like go crazy on this stuff because I really feel it this week, but I know I can't sustain this. No, you need to come up with something that can be sure, that can be consistent. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter number 25. So the first thing is, it should be a sure place. It should be a sure dwelling place. These are the results. This is how your home should look. We're not even talking about how to get there yet. This is how it should look. So if you're doing everything right, if you've got the concepts and you're applying them correctly, you should have a sure dwelling. That's number one. Number two is this. The home should be peaceful. You should have a peaceful home. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel 25, it says, And thus ye shall say to him that live in prosperity, Peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. Look, your home should be a peaceful place. If you are applying the doctrines and the concepts in the Bible properly, your home should be sure, and it should be peaceful. Look at Psalm chapter 127. It should not be a chaotic place. So the question is, I want a sure dwelling, and I want a peaceful dwelling. I don't think anybody would argue with that, but the question becomes, how do we get there? How do we get there? Look at Psalm chapter number 127, and look at verse number 1. Psalm 127, look at verse number 1. The Bible says this, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Now, if you want to apply this to an actual physical home, I mean, this is kind of a, a concept in itself here in Psalm 127.1, but if you want to apply it to your actual house, what it's saying is you have to use the Lord's ideas. You have to base everything that you're doing in your home on the Lord. Turn to Matthew chapter number 12. Matthew chapter number 12. So, I mean, obviously, everything that you do to implement this these concepts in the Bible need, I mean, everything that you implement in your house should come from the Bible. It should come from concepts in the Bible. Turn to Matthew chapter number 12 and look at verse number 43. Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 43. It's funny because the home is actually used as kind of an analogy in many, uh, many stories in the Bible, many parables in the Bible, but it can literally be applied right to your home. Look at Matthew 12 and verse number 43. The Bible says this, Jesus says this, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. So here's talking about somebody that, you know, maybe gets saved and cleans himself up. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth empty, swept, and garnished. It's all cleaned up. By the way, another thing about a sure home is that your, your home should not be a disaster. Like many people live in, in complete disaster. And that is not something that is good. For, look, that stresses people out because if you live in a home that is completely wrecked and completely out of order all the time, it is always different. It is not sure. It is not consistent. What's consistent is we clean up after we do this. We clean, you make your bed, you clean your room, all these different things, all these normal things. It's to keep consistency. All right. So anyway, the Lord needs to build the house. Look at Matthew 12, 43. It's empty, swept, and garnished. It's cleaned up. Then go with he and take it with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. Even so it shall also be unto this wicked, wicked generation. He taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. So obviously this is a concept in the Bible talking about how somebody, you know, that maybe cleans up their life that goes back into sin. It, you know, many times will go back into that sin 
way worse than, and I mean, you've seen, that you've seen this many times if you've been in the Christian life for a few years, that it's, you know, going back into those same things is, it's going to be worse when you go back into them. Saved, you know, even if you're saved, all right? But look, just apply this to a physical house. What is it saying? What is he doing? He's bringing all these unclean things into his house because they go in and they dwell with him in his house. So look, the first point I want to make on how to actually implement a sure dwelling and implement a peaceful home is you need to be careful what you are allowing in the home. You need to think, I always think about it like this. What are conduits into my home? And look, it's not, it's not some new concept to, you know, have a pure home and protect the walls of your home from evil. That is not a new concept. I'm not going to, you know, we don't want to get mysterious and mystic about it and start shaking dead chickens over our doorways or something like that. But the point is, it is biblical to say that you should keep evil and wicked things out of your house. So you need to actually think practically about what are conduits for evil things to get into my house. Because what we are allowing in will directly affect what we output out of our house. Proverbs 17, 13 says, Whosoever rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. That literally says that if evil exits out of your house, evil will enter into your house. If you export trouble, you will import trouble as well. So you need to think about the conduits in and out of your house. Wickedness in, wickedness out. It's not that hard to understand, but what's the practical application of that? Look, it's a little bit more difficult today as there's so many different conduits into our homes today. Now we need to think about standards in the home. What are the inputs? What are the inputs to your home? I mean, first of all, I mean, here's one for the ladies and, you know, the guys too. But you need to think about materials that you purchase. You need to think about school curriculums. These aren't things that should just be flighty, just, you know, snap decisions on what kind of curriculums you set up for your ki kids. I mean, if you, I mean, just look, let's, let's take the examples again. Number one, examples of people who have done this successfully before will be of great help to you here. But second of all, just think about this for a second. What if I just didn't think much about my homeschool curriculum? I'm just like, well, they're home with me. That's good enough. I'm just going to go get all the stuff that the school uses. And you just teach them secular science. You teach them the humanism that the Bible, you know, is against. You teach them the exact agenda of the public school. Well, what will you get? We have plenty of examples. You will get kids that are literally confused, depressed. I mean, see what the public school is, is exporting today. What, what are, why are they exporting that? Because what are they allowing into that house? Whatever you input, you are going to output. So school curriculums, books, reading materials, those things should be gone over with a fine-tooth comb before they are put in the hands of especially your small children. And just the example of other people and knowing people that you trust, knowing other moms that you trust, being able to tell you, yes, uh, we've gone through these books and we know that they're good and things like that, that is a great help to you so you don't have to just sift through everything yourself. But that is one thing that you need to be very careful about. All right, but look, what other conduits into your house are there? Look at all these conduits that we have today. We have the internet today. We have phones today. We have TV today. All of these conduits. And look, the internet, smartphones, TV, these things in themselves are not good or bad. It's like a gun, you know, it's not, it's not good or bad, it's just an object. It's just a system that can be used, I mean, it can be used as a tool for good, it can be used as a tool for bad. So what do we, you know, and look, I'll give you an example for myself, all right? I don't have a TV. And look, I don't, I'm not upset at you if you have a TV. But I don't have a TV, and I'm going to tell you why I don't have a TV. I'm going to give you the concept that I use and why I don't have a TV. Because people will say, well, you can control the content that you bring, especially with streaming now, you can control the conduit, uh, the, the information that comes into your TV and all that stuff, and you don't have to just watch what the programming is or whatever. That's all true, but let me just give you my example of why I've made the decision that I've made. In 2001, 2002, 
It was around this time. Because I can remember, it was a, I wasn't even saved, but it was a conscious decision that I made. I'm not talking about the TV. This is when like the first PlayStation came out, the first Xbox came out, and I was kind of like involved on the back end of some of that technology. But those things started came out, and I was, in, I was involved with a lot of guys that I worked with that were really into some of that stuff that were like heavy gamers and all this stuff. You know, look, I had a job. I could have got this stuff. I could have, I could have got set up with the video games and all this stuff. But you know what? I knew that I would like it too much. I knew that I would like it way too much. And you know what I thought at that time? I was just like, this will completely rob my productivity in my life. Because, I, I mean, I'm watching people that I work with, like, stay up all night long, like, literally till 5 in the morning playing some of this stuff. And, like, they, sometimes they didn't even sleep and just came to work the next day. And I'm just like, I don't want that. I don't even want a temptation about that. And years later, I made the same decision with TV. Just, it's just another level of the same type of thinking. It wasn't, like, look... For me and for any home, let me just tell you something. For any home, for any family, screen time is going to be a problem for you. Let me tell you something. It's a problem in my home. It's a problem. It's, when I say that, it, it needs to be managed. I am constantly managing it with myself and with my family. I don't need to dress it up. I don't need any help. <laughs> I don't need a... You know, I don't need an 82-inch screen or whatever. And I mean, it's... You know, I don't need something to make it harder to manage that problem, that, that fight, that it's not a fight, but that, that struggle of, of screen time. All right, because look, screen time, you better understand as you're raising small children, screen time is a huge problem. I just found, I just picked a, an article, I just Googled an article, I found a recent article titled this, a 50% surge, in, there's a 50% surge in preteen sadness, depression. And I'm just like, what in the world? How in the world is a preteen, somebody that's not even 13, what would they have to be depressed about? I mean, in a peaceful home, nothing is the answer. But a new study published in BMC Public Health, researchers tracked the mental health of a diverse group of teens around the country, this is just the U.S., for two years. They found an association between screen time and depression, anxiety, inattention, and aggression. And I know that that one's true because I literally had somebody outside of my spiritual life bring that up to me about a month ago on how they are limiting screen time for their children because their children are starting to get aggressive. Not somebody I know from church, not anything religious about it, just something they're noticing. That's all. So look, screen time is a huge problem. So if it's a struggle, it's going to be a worse struggle with a huge TV. So I, I don't have one. Because I don't need any more challenges. I'm trying to win this thing. But, you know, then you get the Internet. And here's what the decision we've made for Internet. I mean, obviously, you could just go crazy and just not have any connection to anything in your house. But the Internet is, imp is an important tool that I've always wanted my kids to understand how to use. They need to learn. Like, I've really pushed over the years. Like, you need to learn how to find information on the Internet. You need to learn how to figure things out by using the Internet. And what we have done over the years since the very beginning was we have internet that is monitored, not filtered. Because I want my kids to know how to responsibly use this tool. So it's monitored, not filtered. Now, if you're out there and you're giving your kids when they turn, you know, 10 or 11 or whatever, probably even younger, a phone that's not monitored, that's not, that has nothing on it to where you can see every single thing. That's why I don't have iPhones, by the way. Because you can't, you can't get to everything on iPhones. You can't monitor everything on iPhones. It's too proprietary. So we got rid of the iPhones, and we have our internet, our phones, and our, all our internet PC stuff at the house. It's all monitored, all right? If you're giving your children access to the internet without monitoring or filtering or whatever, you're insane. Like, you're literally crazy if you do that because they will ruin themselves. They will go and they will wreck their life. They will wreck their future. They will get involved in things they shouldn't. They will be seeing things that they shouldn't, hearing things that they shouldn't. And those things you can't unsee and you can't unhear. It's that simple. Social media. Social media. Look, I understand that social media is important and it's how people connect today. I get that. 
I'm not like some crazy person that's like social media is the devil and all this kind of stuff, even though maybe it is. I don't know. It's definitely, but here's the thing. It can be used for good, but from what I've seen, it's mostly not used for good. There needs to be major caution here with kids. And let me tell you something. It's fill, if it, I built, boiled it down to three reasons that I can't stand social media. Number one, it's filled with negativity. Yeah. It is mostly negative. Now, I'm not saying that you can't connect with people and it doesn't work that way. And, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, in the Stone Age or anything like that. But it's filled with negativity. Number two, it gives a voice to people that don't deserve a voice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... People on the internet and social media speaking today, before social media, people would look at the example of what they are and they would be like, what? No one would listen to any of these people, but it gives a voice to people who can create a fake persona or people just don't know who they are and they can literally just have a voice when they don't deserve, you know, anyone's attention. You know, respect is earned. And social media just gives this platform for people to just stand up and just say whatever they want to say. I look, and that's point number three is this. It's not a real representation of people. And I don't know how many times that this needs to be proven through examples. When you see somebody that's like this big YouTuber or they're this big, you know, social media influencer in one way or the other and they turn out to be psychopaths. Or they turn out to be like just like, you know, the parenting is the biggest one. Like, oh, we're the best parents. And like, they're just horrible parents. I mean, how many times do you see that? Or they're, you know, giving some kind of advice on something. They're, they're, the, they're the people that are given the advice that shouldn't be given the advice in every other way. Any possible way. It's not a real representation of people. It's just what social media is. It's kind of a sleight of hand. You only see what those people want you to see. And it's fake. It's fake. And let me just tell you something about social media and, and my family, the practical example. We're not in social media. I was getting an account hooked up for one of the kids uh, a couple days ago. And I'm like, you know, what's your email address? And like, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't one that really was accessible. <laughs> so, but what I'm saying is, like, it's not been something that we've been involved in and it's not missed in, in my household. It's not something that like, oh, I can't be on Instagram, dad, and like, you know, they're up, you know, anyone's upset about that. No one cares about that in my house, all right? But look, there's a secondary danger here too with all of this stuff. So you can mitigate these things and you have to make decisions on these things, whether it be TV, internet, curriculums for your kids, thinking about the conduits into your house. You have to make detailed decisions on all of these areas, all right? But the secondary danger is this, and I kind of mentioned it already, but say you've mitigated all the bad movies and the shows and all this kind of stuff, and you feel like you got that all squared away. I got my internet monitored. This is all, you know, 101 level stuff. But the point is, like, there's a huge waste of time aspect to it, too. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to the screen time, and when it comes to, like, doing things and looking at things and listening to things that you shouldn't be doing, you know, you have to ask the question. It begs the question. Like, what are the things that you're not doing because of all these things? What are your kids not learning because they're plugged into screens or whatever? So you're like, okay, I, I have the screens and I have the TV, but it's all monitored and it's only good stuff and all this. And like, look, first of all, I don't believe you. But second of all, like, it's just a huge waste of their life. What are the things that they should be learning, should be doing with, with you? I mean, kids, I mean, out so many, you're not seeing kids anymore. Are you noticing this? Yeah. Where do you think they are? They're sitting in front of a screen. It's these beautiful days outside, and you used to see kids walking all over the place, in the streets, riding their bikes all over. Look, you're seeing that less and less. It's a trend. It's real. Kids need to be outside. You need to be outside. We live in California, for crying out loud. Like, every day is perfect compared to what... I grew up in. It should be outside. It should be. Here's what they're not doing. They're not outside building anything. They're not outside working. They're not outside learning. You're not outside teaching. I mean, buy an old car, fix it up. My wife's like, no. 
My wife told me a story about soul winning today, and she's like, yeah, it was a great soul winning story. Like, our church has a problem with, with cars. I'm, I'm just joking. It's okay. My wife, she's like, they had these two guys were under this car, and they came out. And you, like, you never would have thought they would listen, but they both came out. They both listened. Like, one guy was upset at first because he was like, we don't have time for this. They're wrenching on this car. And they, she, you know, they get both of these guys saved, and it was just like a great salvation story. And I'm sitting there in the back of my head, and I'm just like, what kind of car was it, though? <laughs> what were they working on? But my point is this. Go do something like that. You know, you know how much you learn or how much your kids would learn by doing something like that? Go, go shoot something. Not someone, something. <laughs> you know, go do things. Spend time together. There's so much to explore and experience even at your own home. And you can create things to explore and experience at your own home, in your own garage, in your own backyard, no matter how big or how small it is. You can come up with projects to do with all these things. So look, the first point is this. It's simple. Controlling the inputs will define the outputs in your home. Garbage in, garbage out. It's that simple. Point number two is this. You know, it's not productive. It's not productive to just spend time in all these bad inputs in your house. I mean, you want your kids to have work ethic or not? You know, you want your kids to learn anything or not. They want to have skills or not. Well, you, I don't have any skills. That's because you're sitting playing video games. That's because in 2001, you decided to play video games. And now you know nothing. Now you don't know how to do anything. I'm so glad that I made that decision because I would have loved it. I'm telling you. I would have loved, you know, getting into all that gaming. It's not that I don't enjoy that type of thing. I'm just glad I never went down the road. So here's a how-to guide. Let me give you this. Go back to Romans chapter 14. I know I, I kept you, you know, holding that for a while, but let's get to Romans chapter 14. Let me give you a methodology tonight on how to set some standards in your home, all right? Do we all need to have the same standards? That's the first thing, all right? And if not, why not? Well, Romans 14 kind of explains this to us. It says, To him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to, not to doubtful disputations. It's saying here that some people, again, the sermon this morning is a perfect application here. Some people are going to have strong faith. Some people are going to have weak faith. I mean, some people, both two people saved, one person is going to have more faith than the other. All right? And that's kind of the basis of why these standards are different. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. So it's the strong one that just has faith in the Bible and a lot of guys will just like say, like, yeah, if you just eat herbs, you're going to be weak, too. That's also true. Okay? But the point is, is that the standards don't need to be exactly the same. All right? The Bible's kind of telling us to be, you know, to not fight over other people's standards. It's not to, to cause conflict in the church. Right. Let him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let not him, sorry. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Look down to verse number five, talking about what days we celebrate here as holidays. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I mean, luckily, we all basically celebrate the same holidays, but I mean, you can't even keep track of all these, like, whatever month it is. I mean, aside from even Wicked Pride Month, I mean, aside from that, I mean, like, last month, what I forgot to tell, I mean, last month was Filipino American month. Did you know that? Okay, you did know that. All right. <laughs> Anyway, I mean, it's just like something new all the time, right? It's something new all the time, so it's hard to know, like, what's actually happening, but the Bible says it doesn't really matter, all right? It doesn't really matter. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. He that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not. As long as everybody's having their standards done for the Lord and not for their own puffed-up pride or some other ungodly reason, it's all good. He's like, you shouldn't judge each other for that. So the first point is not everyone's standards in their home are going to be the same. Like, it bothers me not if you have a TV. That's a different standard than mine, but it bothers me not. Like, it, it doesn't bug me even one bit, all right? If someone has loose standards, and this is why it doesn't bother me, they will deal with that themselves. So if somebody just has their home like, well, I'm just, I have weak faith, so I'm going to have no standards in my home, or I'm going to have really strict standards, actually, is how that would go. But they'll deal with if their standards are biblical or not 
they will deal with that themselves. You will deal with the consequences of your own standards. You see what the Bible is saying here? Turn to Psalm chapter 101. So back to our, our point. We're controlling the input. Psalm 101 says this in verse number 3. It says, here's an application or here's a doctrine to apply to standards that you create in your house. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave unto me. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes, and I will make sure that no wicked thing gets in front of my children's eyes, those who I am responsible for. So you can apply this doctrine to the concept of a father protecting his entire family from wicked things that they may see. So you need to understand that when kids are on the computer, when kids are on the internet, there shouldn't be some accidental way or some way that they could see something that should be supervised, it should be out in the open, it should be something that you are protecting their eyes from wicked things. Same with TV, any media, whatever. All right? So the first thing is control the inputs and, you know, keep wicked things out of your house. Pretty simple, right? But look, here's a caution on this one. I mean, look. If you watch and you consume wicked things, it will, make, it will make your house export wicked things. If you listen to wicked things, you will export wicked things. Again, I, I gave you an example the other night on how I hadn't heard a song for 20 years, and I remembered every single word. Just randomly, something reminded me of it, and I remembered every single word. In our house, and we were even working yesterday, we, we listen when we're working uh, to, you know, Garrett was over, and we were working, uh, Luke and I, we listen to some classical orchestra music. That's a standard that I feel is okay. And, you know, it's been proven. It's been proven that it helps mitigate stress. It helps memory. I've known guys for years that use that type of music just for that reason when they're working. Because it relaxes them. It helps them work. It helps them get through the day. And it helps them do better work. And if you're like, no, I'm only going to listen to hymns and whatever, oh, look, I'm not upset at you. I'm not upset at you. But let me just say this about standards. When you're, when you're building biblical standards in your home, don't go overboard. It's, I want to caution you, don't go overboard. Don't, you know, just be like, we're not going to have a TV. We're not going to listen to anything. We're not going to watch anything. We're not going to go anywhere. We're not going to see anything and then have no replacement for those things. That is disaster in the making. You are going to be in this family and then we're not going to do anything and your life here will just be horrible. Look, that's not really peace in the home. All right, that's not really peace. And look, it's not going to work. So the first methodology is control the inputs, set specific standards. The second one is this. Turn to Romans chapter 2. Beware of hypocrisy. We're talking about methodologies to use setting standards. Beware of hypocrisy. What does that mean? Let's go back to those inputs. Let's go back to those inputs. I'm going to go, I'm going to decide no computer, no TV, none of this stuff, you know, all this, and then I'm going to do all those things. But for everybody else, no, they can't touch any of that stuff, but I'm going to do it. Look at Romans chapter 2 and verse number 3. The Bible says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Look, you have to set standards that you yourself can hold. Because if you don't, one of two things is going to happen. If you set standards that only apply to everybody else in the house, and not you, one of two things are going to ha happen. First of all, your kids are going to label you as a hypocrite at a young age. Turn to Ephesians chapter number 6. Guess what, folks? And again, I don't know why people aren't thinking this through, but your kids are going to be adults one day, and your kids, as they sit in this family integrated church, are learning the Bible. And here's the irony, because you taught it to them. They're going to be adults that know the Bible. They're going to be teenagers that know the Bible. They're going to be 10-year-olds that know the Bible. You should hear some of the profound things that 6, 7, and 8-year-olds in this church say about the Bible. I love it. But we have to be careful because they're going to realize when there's hypocrisy. When you have set standards that you are not following. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 1. 
Look, we should read this whole verse. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. In the Lord, for this is right. They will respect and obey you in the Lord. But hypocrisy is not in the Lord. Setting standards that are biblical, that are good, and then not following them yourself is not in the Lord. So result one, if you set standards that are over the top, is, you know, you know, set standards from the Bible. But rule number one is if you're labeled as a hypocrite, they will lose respect for you where you are outside of the Lord. Because they're going to be adults sooner than you think that they're adults. And they're going to recognize, I've said this once, I'll say it again, kids are hypocrite detectors. And they live with you. And you're in a family integrated church. And they're learning the word of God. And they're understanding the word of God. And when they get saved, their understanding of the word of God is just going to go like this. So first one is they're going to lose respect for you. That's the, if, you, if you are labeled as a hypocrite, they're going to lose respect for you because you're not in the Lord. Hypocrisy is not in the Lord, folks. Number two, the thing that's going to happen is they will reject the standards and overcorrect. Right. Yeah. Yep. Seen it a hundred times. The standards are too strict. They're outside the Bible. Or you're being hypocritical. You're being hypocritical and you're not following the standards. Whatever reason. They're going to lose respect for you if you're a hypocrite. And then if you just over the... T- uh, look, and then if, even if you're a hypocrite, they're going to reject those standards that you're not following. Yep. I mean, just standards that are just way over the top because I'm so holy that I have to come up with more commandments than the hundreds of commandments that are already in the Bible or the hundreds of doctrines that are already in the Bible. Like, you know, well, we're going to be uh, vegans. That's what we're going to do because it's immoral to kill a cow. Laugh it up. It's bad. It happens. It's immoral to kill cows because I'm so holy. And to kill an animal is a horrible thing. So we're going to live on watermelon. Real. Disgusting. Yeah. And, and, to the, and to the person, every single one of those kids will sprint as soon as they can possibly sprint. They're going to be adults one day. And like, then they throw out the standards that you taught. And look, maybe you had good standards. Maybe you had some good standards right here, but then you had a bunch of these crazy standards here. But they take the whole thing and they just throw it out the window. And then what happens? And then you just see them just like go off the rails. They overcorrect. They overreject. And okay, you know, maybe there's, there's, hopefully they're saved, but I mean, who wants your kids going out and just like going into the world head over heels? The standards you set must be biblical and it must become your personal standards. That's how you do it. Or it'd be better not to set them because you will damage them. You will damage them. And look, if you got kids that are just like when they're 18 in one minute, you hear screeching tires. There's a home that's not sure and it's not peaceful. Thousand percent. Here's the third one. Here's the third method on setting standards. Look for an example. Look for an example. You're looking to build an airplane. You're looking to build an airplane. You know the output that you want. Find, Find an output. Find an output that you like. You know the output you want. You're like, I want an airplane. I want an awesome airplane. This airplane is awesome. Luke flew it into a tree today, and it still flies. This is a great plane. You're like, this is what I want. I mean, who wants that? Use an example as a guide. But use an example of something. Look, you got to find a plane that you would want to fly in is what it comes down to when you're looking for an example. Control the inputs. Set achievable and biblical standards that you yourself can be consistent with 
and then look for a plane that you would fly in. Those are the three methodologies. And then guess what? You'll end up with a sure and peaceful home by using those three steps. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.